Welcome to all our brothers and sisters this morning. Whether you came on two legs or whether you came on four, you are most, most welcome this morning. Whether you flew through the air or crawled on your bellies or swam an ocean, you are welcome this morning. You are welcome whoever you are, wherever you have been. You are welcome here with us today. So let us enter together this circle of love and friendship, celebrating the ways that we upright, walking, two-legged wanderers share with our four-legged, lounging, laughing, and the leaping among us. With winged warblers, with slithering, sliding, snaky beings, with circling cavorters in this our watery world, and with those who carry their homes on their backs, all are welcome. We look so different, we move according to the way that each of us are made. Yet look at us all here together in this house of worship, in this house of love, in this one planet sharing this one world. May our celebrations, may our worship together bring us into closer harmony and closer relationship with one another and with all life, with all diverse beings in this our interconnected world. Remembering that we all have common needs and wants and loves. A need for safety, for care, for respect and for love. So welcome, welcome all our brothers and sisters on two legs and on four legs all who are gathered to worship together this day. Welcome. And you're already singing, I see. <laughs> Let's now join together and sing our first hymn for today. Hymn number 68, I Dream of a Church. Hymn number 68. Thank you. 
invite us to join together in a time of prayer, giving thanks for the animals. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for the animals. The animals who live close to nature, who remind us of the sanctities of birth and of death, who do not trouble their lives with foreboding or with grief, who let go each moment as it passes and accept each new one as it comes with both serenity and with grace. Enable us to walk in beauty as they do, at one with the turning seasons, welcoming the sunrise and at peace with the sunset. And as we honour the memory of good friends no longer with us, now departed, who loved abundantly and in their time were loved too, who gave us freely of their love and their affection and their loyalty, who freely gave us all that they had. Just remember them. Let us learn from them not to be anxious for tomorrow, but to ask only that kindness and that gratitude fills our hearts as we move through life day by day on into the passing years. Let us live in beauty, in love and in grace singing the joy of living together. Loving God, we give thanks for the animals. May we learn what they can teach us. Amen. Now, I've got a little, a little story to share with you this morning, a story about a noble, noble deer. Now, it's a story that there are many versions of this story in many, many lands throughout the world. There is a version from this country. There's a version apparently found in the Philippines. But this version is based on a version from India. So, across seven great seas and over seven great mountains, always seven, I don't know why, it's just the way stories are written and stories are told. Maybe there's something about the number seven. There will, beyond these great seas and these great mountains, there was the most magnificent forest in all the known world. Its trees were like no other trees, the tallest trees in all the world, and it was the thickest, densest forest in all of the world. But occasionally you would come across a, a little pond of water or a little glade of green grass. It was a beautiful, beautiful forest. But there was something very, very extra special. It sounds pretty special already, doesn't it, this forest? Well, there was something even more special about this forest. Well, there lived a great creature in this forest. The greatest, the finest, the most magnificent deer in the whole world. It was larger than any other deer, much larger than the deer you find in Dunham Massey, lovely as they are, but this was a magnificent, magnificent deer. And the most glistening brown coat you have ever seen, and the most magnificent antlers. Its antlers were almost as large as the deer itself, and it had the most complex and amazing antlers you have ever seen. This was a deer of great legend. But of course, as is the way of many humans, there were many hunters that wanted to capture this great deer. No response. You're not a sympathetic lot, are you? 
All the great hunters decided they wanted to capture the deer. So they would come from far and wide over the great seven oceans and over the great mountains into the thick, dense forest and they would try to shoot the deer. Can anybody make the sound of a bow and arrow? Because I can't do it. Anybody else do that for me? No? Give, give it a go. They would try to shoot the deer with the... You're going to have to do a bit better than that, aren't you? They would try and shoot and capture the great deer with their bows and their arrows. But they could not. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Lovely to see you. You've not been out hunting deer, have you? Parking trouble. It's always a problem in Altrincham, I know. Well, you've not come over seven great mountains or seven great seas, have you? Good, good, good. But it's lovely to see you. But they could not capture this great deer. And the king, who was a great king and apparently a great hunter of amazing prowess, he also decided one day to go hunting the deer. He took many of his servants with him and he rode on his magnificent horse. Nobody going to make a horse noise. No, not, you're not bothered. You're not very enthusiastic this morning. I bet our little friends would be more enthusiastic, wouldn't they? Thank you, Margaret. We've got somebody who would join in. Thank you. We can always rely on our Margaret. So the king, that's what, I've got to remember the story, haven't I? The king decided he would hunt for the great deer. He entered the great forest on his horse and looked around and quickly caught sight of the deer. And he immediately took out his bow and arrow and pulled back. Wow, that's good. And the deer heard him pull back on the arrow and quickly shot off into the forest so he could not cannot capture the deer with his bows and arrows. Well, the king, don't look so worried, Jenny. It's all right. <laughs> the king went chasing after the deer and all his huntsmen followed after him. They were servants here. Now they've become huntsmen, but don't worry. I've just got the story slightly wrong. They went, but their horse wasn't quite as strong and as fast as the king's horse. So the king soon found himself all alone in the middle of the thick, dense forest with just him and the deer. But he could not capture the deer. Every time he got close to the deer, he seemed to almost be teasing him, actually. It would kind of slow down a bit and let him catch up. But he could never get so close. But after he'd been travelling for some distance through the thickening, thickening forest, he suddenly realised he was lost and all alone. And he was thirsty. And he was hungry. And he was a little bit scared. No sympathy? No, not really. He's a hunter. No, oh well, never mind. And it, the forest was so thick that the horse could not really continue. So he, he dismounted from the horse and began to look around for some light. And he just saw some glistening in the distance and saw some water. So he headed towards the water in the ever thickening forest. And he leant forward to try and drink from the water. But he was a bit of a clumsy clot, this king. And he stumbled and fell, in, fell into the earth just around the water. Tried to pull himself free. But he was getting more and more stuck. And as he tried to pull himself free, he noticed he was sinking. Oh, yeah, one or two sympathetic souls in here this morning. And he struggled more and more in the quicksand. But the more he struggled, the deeper he sank. Till he was up to almost his waist. You, you care, don't you, Margaret? And he thought this was going to be the end. And then just in front of him, through the opening, through the trees, he saw a little twitching nose. Anybody do a twitching nose? Oh, that's a good one, yeah. Well, that's impressive. You can come again. A very impressive twitching nose. And then he saw a face. And then he saw some great, great antlers. And the face looked at him with loving eyes and seemed to be beckoning towards the king. And the, and the deer, you could work it out by now it was the deer. Yeah, you got that bit, haven't you? The deer seemed to inch closer and closer to the king. And seemed to lean forward and seemed to be offering its great antlers to the king. And the king reached out 
his hands and grabbed hold of the antlers and the strong, the great strong deer, he pulled him free. But when the king was back on dry land, he bowed before the great, great deer. You are a truly noble creature, he said. You saved the very one who was determined to kill you. You deserve great riches as reward. And being a king, he had a bag full of gold. Kings do have these sort of things. I know we don't tend to have those in Altrincham, do we? Do we? No, no, maybe not. Maybe those new plastic five-pound notes, but, but not bags of gold. Hello. And he offered the gold to the deer. But the deer wasn't really interested in gold. He was more interested in nibbling leaves and nibbling grass. But the king knew that he should reward that great deer. And, and eventually the king did find his way back home. And he decided that he would decree that this great deer would be left to live in peace and that he would no longer hunt for merely for sport alone and that the forest would be a sanctuary for all the deer and all the animals. And some thoughts of the great, magnificent and noble deer. There are lessons in that story, but I'm not going to teach them for you this morning. I think you can pick those lessons up yourself. Now I'm going to share a little reading with you now. From um, This is taken from Journeying in Place by Gunilla Norris. Just a short little reading. This, is more, this isn't about deer, this is more about the birds of the air and something perhaps that we could learn how to live in community, how to live in spiritual community perhaps with one another. This is a lesson from, from geese actually. Another favourite animal of mine. So Gunilla Norris wrote... What I learned is that of all the creatures that I can see in this landscape, the geese best represent the communion of saints. They depend on one another. The lead geese does the most work, but when it is tired, it falls back and another takes its place. To be able to rely on others is a deep trust that does not come easily. The geese fly in the wake of one another's wings, they literally get a lift from one another. I want to be with others this way. Geese tell me it is indeed possible to fly with equals. And it's possible for all of us to do the same. We can live from one another's energy. We can live in communion with one another, in community with one another, if we just learn to live like the geese have learnt to fly. Flying free. Let's now join together and sing our second hymn for this morning. Hymn number 189, we celebrate the web of life. Hymn number 189.
This reading is from Medicine Cards by Jamie Sams and David Carson. And it's about, about white buffalo, which are extremely rare and only occur in one out of every 10 million births. All animals are sacred, but in many Native American traditions, white buffalo is most sacred. The appearance of white buffalo is a sign that prayers are being heard, that the sacred pipe is being honored, and that the promises of prophecy are being fulfilled. White buffalo signals a time of abundance and plenty. Buffalo was a major source of sustenance for the Plains Indians. It gave meat for food, hides for clothing, warm and soft robes for long winters and hooves for glue. The medicine of buffalo is prayer, gratitude and praise for that which has been received. Buffalo medicine is also knowing that abundance is present when all relations are honored as sacred and when gratitude is expressed to every living part of creation. Because of its desire to give the gifts that his body provided, and because of his willingness to be used on earth for the highest good before entering the hunting grounds of spirit, Buffalo did not readily stampede and run from hunters. Buffalo medicine is a sign that you achieve nothing without the aid of the great spirit, and that you must be humble enough for that assistance, and then be grateful for what you receive. Thank you, Carolyn. Some wisdom on the, about the white buffalo. It's wonderful to be here together this morning, all we animals together. And we are all animals, are we not? We may not think we are, but we're all formed from the same flesh, from the same earth as the animals. We are animals important to remember that in fact the word animal itself comes from the latin animalis which actually means having a soul having a soul or animus similar word which shared a similar root which meant breath or spirit so to be an animal an animus or animal or animalis is to have soul is to have spirit. We're all formed from the same earth, creatures of the earth, humans and animals too. We all have the same spirit within us, animating our very lives. We are animated by the one spirit. We live in the one world, animated by the one spirit. But somewhere along the lines, we thought we were above all that, we human beings, or we have done. We can think we're very rational, deep thinkers, can't we, we humans? And, but yet, people of ancient times or from past cultures believed, lived much more closely to the animals and saw the animals perhaps as teachers who could teach them something, how to really live with nature and to be full human beings. And maybe that's a lesson that at times we modern human beings, we great rational thinkers, have forgotten and maybe it would do serve as well to admit, to try and remember that maybe there is much that we can learn from our brothers and our sisters from our kin the animals from these lovely creatures all amongst us this morning it's lovely to see them lovely to hear them too so don't worry about the noise now jesus actually taught so many lessons about the animals that we could actually learn from the animals in Matthew's and Luke's gospel he talked, he talked to his followers that they should be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves that to be a disciple you must learn the wisdom of the snake as wise as serpents but as gentle as doves that that is the lesson of discipleship to live that kind of life that it was a dangerous world out there and that you would need wisdom to survive but not to become hard-hearted either. 
And of course, the dove is a wonderful symbol in the Judeo-Christian tradition. We, we see the symbol of the dove appearing in Noah's ark, bringing back the olive branch and sealing that communion, reminding us of our humility that we are connected to the earth, that we live in the cycle and the circle of life and that we are all part of this one world and that we should, we should accept that with humility. To be human is to be humble. And the, the root again of the word humble and humanity and humus is from the earth. We are formed from the one earth. We have the one spirit flowing through us all. We could learn so much from our animal brothers and how to live in the present moment. They don't worry about the past. We get caught up in what the future might be. They simply accept life with love and with grace and live their lives as best they can. They don't, animals in the wild don't seem to get depressed or overweight, yet so many of we humans, myself included at many times in my life, I certainly suffer from being overweight and have suffered from other psychological problems in, in my time too. And, but animals in the wild, they don't seem to worry about these things. They simply accept who they are. Perhaps we could learn from them too. They're like Zen masters as well, and, and yogi, and great yoga teachers too. They sit and peacefully accept their lives. They don't get all caught up in worry. And if you've ever watched a cat, it's the greatest practitioner of yoga. Christine will know about this. You could ever see they stretch and loosen their limbs like no human being can. Again, perhaps we could learn lessons from them too. They have so much to teach as the animals amongst us if we would just observe them and perhaps live as close to life and as close to nature as perhaps some of them do. There are many lessons that we can learn from the animals. If we could join together and sing our third hymn for today, hymn number 93, let us sing of Earth's Progression, hymn number 93.
lovely, beautiful voice that dog of yours has, Denise. Thank you so much. And I'd like to invite Jenny forward, who's going to share a reading with us. This reading is taken from Writing Past Dark, Envy, Fear, Distraction and Other Dilemmas in the Writer's Life by Bonnie Friedman. Outside the cathedral, holding ancient relics in Valencia, a woman kissed pigeons. She saw these birds as symbols of God, grey and white and black as discarded shells. These were creatures I'd been taught to think of as filthy. They seemed filthy, in fact, with their staring orange eyes and patchy feathers. But now, while I looked, they turned into doves. Of course, they always were doves. Or rather, of course, doves always really were a type of pigeon. But I never really believed it until this woman showed me her belief. Her kiss transformed ugliness to beauty. So it was like a fairy tale, after all. It was the old story. What is loved reveals its loveliness. Here she squatted, radiant, smiling, enrobed in life, in a dozen pairs of folded wings, in a dozen pairs of pearl grey. And as I looked, yes, even lavender, even royal purple wings. A woman in an ordinary black cotton dress who smiled as if she knew she was the luckiest person on earth swathed in blessing. Thank you. Swathed in blessing indeed. That that is love becomes loveliness itself indeed. Now we hold our annual animal blessing service on the nearest Sunday to the feast day of St. Francis, a 13th century monk who saw divinity as much and saw animals as much as kin as he saw his human brothers and sisters too. He would commune with the animals, on it, just as he would commune with people too. He would pray, he would sing with the animals. And there were many, many stories told of Francis. I'm just going to share a little tiny one here. Once when Francis was about to eat with Brother Leo, he was greatly delighted to hear a nightingale singing. And he stopped eating and he said to Brother Leo, why don't we join in and sing a duet with this beautiful nightingale? Now, Brother Leo was a bit concerned that he wasn't the greatest singer. One or two people who come to Dunham Road sometimes say that to me, that they don't feel like they're the greatest singer, but they do join in with the singing. Brother Leo wasn't too keen, but Brother Francis, he sang his heart out. And the nightingale, the nightingale sang back at him. He lifted his voice in praise and sang the joy of living as the nightingale did the same thing too. And you hear similar stories of this within the Jewish tradition actually. And in the book, what, in the book, What Do Jews Believe by David S. Ariel, this is what he wrote. While a citizen believed in the importance of observing the mitzvah, learning Torah and praying with devotion, they believed there was a deeper spiritual realm of listening to the world as the song of God. The disciples of Majid of Metzritz, for example, noted that their teacher went to the pond every day at dawn and stayed there for a little while before returning home again. 
One of his students once explained that he was learning the song with which frogs praise God. And I have a similar experience to both these great teachers. I don't claim to be a, a great teacher. I'm just some bloke from Burstall in West Yorkshire. But I have a similar experience only here in Dunham Road many, 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 many times where I live often on the top of my little house a little blackbird sings. And sometimes when I come home and I hear him singing I join in. And what a strange thing happens when I sing back at this blackbird. His voice seems to raise up and he sings a slightly sweeter song. Now I don't know if he's been a critic of my voice or if he's encouraging me to sing ever more sweet, well, more loudly perhaps. I'll take it as a sign of encouragement more than a sign of criticism. But it's lovely to stand and sing together and sing the joy of living in all its amazing mystery. We join together. There's something about that, and there's something about that singing, there's something about connecting to animals and to all life, which brings me in a deeper connection and deeper relationship with my own inner being and, and develops that kind of compassionate aspect of my own humanity. And compassion, of course, is at the core of all great religious and spiritual beliefs and all great traditions. It's about developing a more compassionate way of living and opening ourselves up more spiritually and, and increasing our sensitivity to all life and to all creation. And that sometimes can be quite difficult and quite painful, of course it can. But I have learned it's the only way really to believe. It's the only way to truly live. It's the only way to live a truly connected and interconnected life and to feel a part of life, to really develop that aspect of myself so that when I look at what I see in the mirror looking back at me into my own eyes, I see a loving, compassionate human being when I see connection. And when I do that and I look into your eyes, I see love and compassion and connection. I see that same spirit animating your lives as animates all life. And I see that same spirit in these ones that you're holding in your arms today, most of you. When you look into their eyes and into the eyes of all life, do you see animal? Do you see animus? Do you see animalis? Do you see soul? Do you see spirit? Do you see connection? Do you feel we are formed from the same earth and have that same spirit, that one breath of all life running through us? Because if you do, I believe, I believe, it will help you connect to those deeper aspects of yourselves and those deeper aspects of all life and live more open, loving, happy and joyful lives. And we can all then join in together and sing the joy of living in all its mystery. Let's pay homage to the animals amongst us and the animals all around us. And let's pay homage to love to one another and sing a song of praise. And what I'd like to do now, if I dare, if we all dare, is to invite our little friends forward with their two-legged helpers to come forward to the front of chapel and I'm going to offer a blessing upon us all before we come together and sing our final... Now this is a dangerous thing, I'm, going, I'm taking a risk here, but if you wish to come forward, if you dare, and bring our little friends, because let them bless us with their beauty so we can look at them properly and look into their loving eyes and then I will offer some words of blessing and then we'll come together and sing our final hymn. Are we coming forward, Gwyneth? Thank you. It's all right, they're going to sing their songs of praise first. Come on. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> now look at... Oh, I see. <laughs> Chaos has ensued. <laughs> what was it they say? Never work with children and animals. They? Well, I work, with, I work with Unitarians. They're much more complex and much more traditional. So we could just perhaps still ourselves. Is it possible? That's lovely. Let's bring 
Pete, we need St. Francis really, don't we, to do this. So let's offer a prayer and a blessing to the animals. You, birds of the air, hawk, sparrow, and laughing jay, you remind us of freedom, delight us with your song, astound us with feats of imagination. I think I'm going to make it a short blessing. <laughs> Thank you for bringing these wonderful gifts of your friends and your family with us, with us today. Let's give thanks for the animals amongst us and the animals within us and the spirit that, that animates all our lives. And let's bless the world with our blessing as they have blessed us with their presence and their songs today. Let's go in love. Let's go in peace together. And let's come together now and sing our final hymn. So thank you animals amongst us. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. But if we now join together and sing our final hymn for this, for this day. Hymn number 167. Let's fly free. There is a place I call my own. Hymn number 167. like the birds of the air. Gracious Creator, hear and bless thy beasts and singing birds and guard with tenderness small things that have no words. Fill our hearts, fill our spirits with love, with connection. Animate us with that one spirit. Fill our hearts. 
Let's leave this place touched by our time together. And let's carry that spirit with us in all that we feel, all that we think, all that we say, all that we do. Go in love. Amen.